Glenda, go ahead. Great. Thank you. Everybody can see my screen, I hope. Yes. Fine. Great. Okay, nice to see everybody. Um, I'm going to get right into it because I know we are very tight with time. So um, today I will be presenting with my colleagues Michelle Wilmers and Bianca Masuku, who are in the room. Um, and we are going to be presenting um, our first kind of foray into producing um, models of open textbook development. Um, and this particular work um, is based at the University of Cape Town. Um, we are, our project is called Digital Open Textbooks for Development. And it is a project that has a research component and implementation component in that um, academics were given small grants to produce open textbooks. Um, and it also has an advocacy um, component. So we'd like to thank the IDRC for their support in this particular project right up front. Um, and that is our Creative Commons license. So part of our process um, and part of our thinking, and this is still developing um, along the way, is to find a uh, um, and suggest a definition. And as Leanne also started her presentation looking at, at open pedagogy and, and trying to define it, we were also trying to define open textbooks. Um, we find the, the idea of a textbook quite um, attractive to people who are not aware of openness because they kind of understand the idea of a textbook. Um, and here, I'm not going to read this now because we don't really have that much time, but we're looking at the, the idea of it being scaffolded around a course um, with all those multimedia affordances that the digital provides, um, including collaborative authorship models. And we'll be talking about that collaboration as we go along. So we're going to be talking about participatory pedagogy um, and, and suggest a kind of way of uh, and models of that. But what we also want to tell today is a kind of a little bit of a story in a very short time around open textbook journeys. So introduce the people that we're doing and, and talk a little bit about what they were doing. Uh, this is not going to be um, a heavily th theoretical presentation. Um, we really want to focus on the models, which are going to come up in a little while. But we must mention and, and um, reinforce that our approach is informed with the social justice imperative. Um, and it is the way that we view open textbooks and we feel that open textbooks can provide a way of redressing social injustice. And we look specifically towards Nancy Fraser's work um, as, as a way of um, framing our research um, at the bottom of the slide, you will see there's a reference. We, we did um, produce a paper earlier in this year, if you're interested in reading more. So what we've done um, very briefly is we're very interested in the drivers and motivations for open textbooks. So what we're trying to tell here is, is, is the story of these open textbooks. So it's not only what did they create, but why did they create it and how did they go about creating it? And we feel that the motivation and the driver is a very important in the actual success of the textbook at the end. And they're quite typical drivers that, that um, this audience might be aware of. So perhaps it's, it's affordable access, that's why you want to create an open textbook, or maybe you want to translate a textbook, or you want to look at curriculum transformation. And in our context, that is directly related to decolonizing the curriculum. So that's our emphasis there. Or maybe you want to do something that involves pedagogical innovation. And we can see in the second column how these map to the social justice dimensions. Um, so we've done quite a bit of this mapping. I'm not going to get into it too much now. But we see in our textbooks that there's an affirmative response in the textbooks towards addressing these injustices. So we see that textbooks are saving students money. We see that we have examples of, of terminology being translated. We see examples of local cases um, and relevant text being included in these open textbooks. Um, collaboration with college, colleagues empowering their voice. Um, and we also see examples of deliberately changing teaching practice, pedagogical practice to include students. 
So this, this slide, and you'll see a few more versions of this particular slide, shows all our participants. Um, and so to start developing these models, we've started working, we're showing you the back end of how we're working out what these models could be and what's actually happening with these open textbooks. So here you can see that eight of the, the, the people involved in our study, the open textbook authors, were driven by affordable access. It seems to be a theme, but curriculum transformation was certainly very important, as was pedagogical change. So you can see how we're kind of mapping out drivers, and you'll see um, later on when Michelle talks, how we've mapped out other areas um, that we feel are important. Um, I think I just skipped a slide. Oh no, there we go. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Bianca, who is going to be talking about our wonderful authors. Thanks, Glenda. Hello, everybody. Um, so what we wanted to do here with this slide is showcase the dot, the dot for D open textbook authors. And um, this cohort of academics uh, made up the sample for, the, for our study, the dot for d study, and comprised largely of grant recipients from the dot for d um, grants program. And as study participants, they informed um, the research arm of the project through various research activities that we've undertaken in the past two years. Um, and as you can see, this cohort of academics represented a variety of disciplines. We have people who come from chemistry, um, architecture, mathematics, um, marketing, um, etc. And because of the very disciplinary backgrounds that the authors emerged from, um, their open textbook projects were based on their different disciplinary contexts and the varied principles and influences within them. Um, they were also motivated by different kinds of social justice drivers, as Glenda has mentioned already. Um, so some authors wanted to prioritize student voices in their work. Other authors wanted to um, better reflect local um, context and local experiences. And other authors wanted to change the dynamics and practices within their own classrooms. Um, and what we wanted to highlight here is the fact that because of their varying backgrounds and their varying drivers behind their work, um, all of our authors made use of very different approaches in terms of their content creation, um, in their authorship, uh, in terms of their quality assurance processes, and also in their publishing. Um, and this reveals the different kinds of paths and options available um, for open textbook journeys. Um, and so within these journeys, the varying approaches and strategies and um, processes that they that were employed by these academics in their open textbook projects um, resulted in varying degrees of success and different kinds of outputs being produced. Um, and so the rest of our presentation will be elaborating further on this um, and showing the different approaches and models that have emerged from the different kinds of work that each of our authors did. Um, but if you would like to get a closer look or get to know our authors a little better, you can click on the highlighted links here, um, where we've kind of we've kind of told a very shortened story about who they are, what motivates them, and what kinds of things they were wanting to produce. Um, I'm going to hand over to Michelle now, who will elaborate yeah, a little further. Yes. Thanks, Bianca. Hi, everybody. So we're very interested to try and drill down a little into what we're seeing around authorship, quality assurance, and publishing processes. When we look at authorship models, we see a range of different approaches. Um, probably not surprising to you, the, we do see that the, the approach is strongly context-driven um, and driven by drivers in terms of what inspires people to do the work in the first place. I think one of the standout features of what we see in authorship models is that authors rarely work alone. And I think this um, echoes the work of some of our colleagues, the idea that open textbook development, it takes a village. Um, it's hard to do it on your own. And even in cases where um, authors choose to work as solo entities traditionally, they invariably bring students and colleagues involved um, into the authorship process. Um, interestingly, in the authorship models, we also see that academics are often thrust into what we call the editor-in-chief role. 
um, albeit sometimes slightly reluctantly, but somebody is in the position of needing to corral content um, to both write, coordinate and quality control. So we see our academics being um, kind of, as I say, put into this new role, which they, I think, are still making sense of themselves as part of the, the new roles and professional identity that they take on in some of these, these functions that they play. Um, within authorship, we see in a number of instances that the content creation approach is embedded in the classroom um, with the teaching. So students are producing and reviewing work as part of their coursework. Um, and I think this speaks to another challenge in terms of authorship models overall, which is the issue of time, both the limitation on academics time and the challenge of using students in authorship processes where content creation timeframes don't neatly align with semester or academic year timeframes. Moving on from authorship models to talk about quality assurance models. Similarly, we see a range of approaches. Um, I think we're starting to see that there is a, a spectrum or a continuum of quality assurance processes. The one instance in which there was a Delphi consensus study we see as an interesting case in which quality assurance actually takes place before a resource is produced. So in that instance, a study was done to identify gaps in the curriculum and the textbook was developed in line with the outcomes of the study. And certainly in this content context, rather, utility and accessibility are very important components of quality assurance for us. Again, strongly you see a student component in terms of student review. Nine of the 11 initiatives worked with students in reviewing content, um, which also um, in, was embedded in the classroom approach around the development of the work. And finally, on publishing models, um, this is an area particularly that we feel academics are still grappling with, seeing themselves as publishers, and probably not a surprise that we see a strong focus here on authors and initiatives as self-publishers, but we are seeing some other models emerge, particularly in terms of our library, functioning as a publisher, and in some instances, authors working with open access publishers to make their work optimally openly available. Linda, I'm going to hand back to you. Okay, so in our whirlwind presentation, I'll do the last few slides. Um, so I just wanted all of you listening here to think about why why you would want to create an open textbook. And, and as we've emphasized this idea of drivers and motivation, we're quite interested for you to also reflect on that at this point. And what we're going to just highlight now in the next couple of slides is some emerging pathways that we've seen. So what we've tried to do here is to try and um, elaborate uh, the first kind of direction of different kinds of models that we're seeing. And, and as we saw, as we've mapped out in our tables, uh, a key driver was curriculum transformation. Um, and it was about curriculum change, curriculum transformation, local examples, local content, and that decolonization that is so important in our context. Um, and it came through the form of collaboration. So the collaboration of colleagues and collaboration with students. And this particular orthopedics a textbook was an example of great success in this area. Um, and we have other models around this, but there seems to be a cluster around this, this driver of transformation, but this work that is collaborative. Um, and here, quality assurance, assurance through students and colleagues. Um, in the bottom left hand of the corner, we've just put in a little, um, a little block around the small amount of money that was given to, to this lead academic to actually do this project it really didn't cost a lot of money. Um, it was quite remarkable, actually, um, how little to produce something that is available easily online. So collaboration model. We've also found um, a pedagogical change model, which for us has been very powerful, showing the affordance. 
Thanks. Thanks, Willem. Um, showing the affordance of open textbooks to allow a change in the classroom. And when I say classroom, our classrooms are virtual now, but that teaching space um, to, to really explore and explicitly um, arrange the classroom space so that students are creating content that can be in the open textbook. So not only student review or, or student perhaps um, examples, but actually students creating content. Um, and then students also as part of the uh, quality assurance process. So this was a very powerful model that, that we found. Um, and also slightly, slightly more resourcing here, but still relatively um, inexpensive, I would say, with the work that these people have actually produced. So then I suppose we have to talk about what didn't work. And so not all of our projects were completed. Um, and I, I think this is an inevitable that this is going to happen. Um, and, you know, these people set out with grand uh, aspirations of student empowerment and pedagogical change, curriculum transformation, almost, almost too grand. Um, and we, it's not really about the solar authorship because we know that solar authorship can work. So Michelle mentioned earlier, it is an issue of time. It's whether you have the time to do this, but it's an issue of timing. So we had a year for these people to use the grant money. And perhaps in that time, there was another project that was more um, pressing for them than this open textbook project. So they're all open textbook creators, but they didn't complete what they started out to do. So perhaps they will have this opportunity at a later stage. So this is the final slide. I'm hoping that there might be, no, it's not even really, there might be one minute for, for uh, questions. But yes, so this is what we're kind of looking at, um, these kinds of models, but we, we're recognizing behind the authorship approaches is a social justice approach, um, approach that's looking at, at reducing cost of textbooks, but, but more than that, curriculum transformation is very important. We're looking at a range of very interesting quality assurance mechanisms, often a concern, but crucially, we want to emphasize the idea that there needs to be some support. And for some of these authors, that little bit of grant money made all the difference. We didn't have to support them after we gave them the grant in a lot of ways. Um, some people needed more support than others, but that bit of money just enabled them the, to be able to get students to help them, to be able to get colleagues in or some editors or some, that, with the grant, cannot be sort of underemphasized as something that's a real start for this process. So that's all from us. So perhaps, Philip, there's a minute for questions. If there are any questions, I can't see the chat as presenter. Um, I'm hoping there might be a question. Yeah, there, there, uh, thank you very much, Glenda. There's a, a question and that's, um, um, why are not the university publishers uh, involved? A lot of universities have a, a publishing unit, uh, so why aren't they involved? So we we do have we do have examples of that. Um, so we so we encouraged a range of different publishing opportunities. We didn't uh, say you have to go through the university the library system. We let people choose what they wanted to do, whatever time, whatever would work for them. Um, so we do have a, have a wonderful example of a textbook, a marketing textbook that's been, that will come through the library um, publishing system, which is a very new system at UCT. So this was quite exciting to be able to experiment with it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, time is up. And um, so thank you uh, to Bianca,